My name is Frank Murata, and a little bit about my background. I've been fishing probably for about 16 to 18 years with fly fishing. I'm a self-taught guy. Uh, I'm the average Joe that comes out and does things, but for whatever reason, I was lucky enough to be mentored by a lot of people to be productive in fishing. So today what I'm doing is I'm going to try and pass on a lot of that information to the general public. The seminar itself is going to take you through two different techniques today. Uh, things that I found out that work on a lake where if you kind of follow some of the things that I teach today, it'll make it a lot easier for you to be able to get on the water and be successful without having to go through all the growing pains that it took me 16 years to learn. My name is Frank Murata and um, you know, it's, it's one of those, I've, I've been self-taught guy. I've been fishing probably anywhere between 16 and 18 years with a float tube. What I am going to cover today is just an overview of certain things. There are probably two techniques that I've learned more than anything else, and not saying that there are more, but two techniques that I found out about 80% of the time are very effective, and it doesn't matter what still water, lake, or uh, venue that you go to, whether it's down here at Laguna Niguel, Irvine Lake, Lake Cuyamaca down in San Diego, Mammoth Lakes up in, in the Sierras, Crawley Lake, Pyramid Lake, Nevada, these techniques work, and they work very efficiently. So the job is, is to give you a little bit of an uh, overview of it as to what these things work, what I've learned, what, I've, what I use, and it's not something that I'm just advertising, but it's something that I, I actually go out and do. So a lot of the things that you hear today is what I actually practice. Third thing is finding fish. And in order to find fish, we take it for granted about a lot of things that we, we discuss and how you do it. It's like today, you're learning something a little bit different. Well, learning how to find fish, whether it's off the water, whether it's on the water, whether it's in the water, I'm gonna point those things out. You probably do about 80 or 90% of these things. But the whole objective is, is to have a good still water experience once you know the techniques now let's go out and be able to find the locations as to where I would fish to make myself successful. And that's the whole idea of today's talk, okay? Stripping streamers, okay? It's the guy, not the fly, okay? And you're going to hear another term later on when I get under still water nymphing that's going to change everything at the same time. But if you notice that underneath the parentheses and quotes, it's the lost art. Ever since still water nymphing took place probably about 10 years ago, and became so prominent, that's all you see on the water is a bunch of little floating bobbers or indicators, and that's it. You never see anybody stripping streamers anymore. But it's a lost art. But it's something that will make you very well rounded in what you do. Okay? And that's what we're going to talk about now. What I will do, go ahead, with equipment needs and all the rest, I'm going to get into rods and the rods that I use and the reason why I use these rods, the reels that I use, the line that I use. Okay? It's going to give you a basic overview of some of the necessary tools that you need in your flow tube, your boat, whatever you're fishing out of, in order to be successful. Just as an idea, I'm like a bass guy when it comes to fly rods. When I'm in my flow tube, I have four fly rods with me already rigged, ready to go. For any circumstance that comes along my way that I see what's going on in the water, I have the opportunity to not have to sit there and re-rig. So let's get into the equipment itself. Streamer rods itself, I use anywhere between a four and six weight rod. They can be nine to 10 feet long, okay? The important thing to remember, and, and what I do in, in a lot of my classes at the same time, is I tell you that don't buy what I use. Reason being is because it doesn't fit your style. What I like to use is I like to use a softer rod to absorb the shock of the strike. The ability to throw for distance, softer rod which is gonna absorb the shock, so that way when I do get, get a bite, or I do get hit, I have the ability to not have to have the uh, fish break off the line. Reels. I think, you know, most people look at it and they say, well, look at a reel that matches the rod and what I have in parentheses is capacity. Look for something that matches your rod and have the appropriate capacity that goes with the rod, okay, and the line that you're using. The other thing I look at is drag system, system, and I think that a drag system is necessary. Most of you are familiar with two types of to reels. Spring and Paul, which is a clicker system, which I call traditional types of fly fishing of what we used to use before, or something with a drag system. 
I don't care if it's a felt drag, if it's a cork drag, if it's a conical drag. Get something with a drag system to it because not everybody is proficient with their finger and the cork and the line between their hands in order to control the fish. And especially with stripping fish, these things have the ability to either travel real fast where you can't keep up with it. It may take you off in a certain direction and you're not ready for it. A drag system will help you to be able to fight that fish because you never know when you're going to have a fish of a lifetime. Let's look at lines, okay? And typically what I, I do is, first of all, when I'm streamer fishing, I want the ability to cover the water column, okay? That could be one inch, six inches below the surface, all the way down to the lake bottom, okay? And to make things easy, instead of carrying, where's Kevin? Five rods in your hand? <laughs> uh, I broke it down to basically two sets of lines that I use. I learned about what they call a clear intermediate line. And a clear intermediate line basically has the sink rate of a type 2 line. It works very well for stealthy conditions. Certain times of the year, you're going to be stripping in, in creek channels of stuff coming into the lakes. Two feet, three feet, one foot of water. You want your fly to be suspended within that six inches. Your ability to be able to have to do that allows you with an intermediate line. And being clear, it also gives you stealthiness at the same time. The second one, when I'm in 10 to 20 feet of water, I recommend a type 3 uniform full sinking line. With full sinking line, they're typically dark in color. Uniform sink allows the line to be able to get through the water column without having a belly. The ability for me to be able to get down into the water column and not real fast, because I know people who use type 4s, type 5s, type 6s, it actually gets down the water column too fast, and you don't want that to happen. There are certain things about fluorocarbon line that makes it work much better than monofilament. Okay? Um, did you know that fluorocarbon is two times denser and heavier than <coughs> monofilament line? Okay? When you're fishing subsurface, that helps your line not to float, but to be able to have a sink rate as well. It's waterproof. And what that entails is when it's in storage, it doesn't disintegrate, it doesn't break down once it touches water of the environment. Numerous things that are in a still water environment. But what I've come across, two separate things that I probably have seen more so than any other still water venue than I have overall in my fishing career. First one, baitfish fry. It could be trout fry, crawly, it could be sacramental perch, um, it could be bass perch in Laguna Niguel, but all of it based around the same thing. Now this happens what times of the year? It usually happens up in the fall, up in the Sierras, down here right now in Laguna Niguel. Wait until about March, April, bass fry are going to be out because the spawn is taking place. Guess what? Trout love to eat a high protein meal with the least amount of effort and when you see these guys out in the water that's what they're going to be going after. Damsel fly. I've seen that probably prevalent in every single still water venue I've been in. And these little guys are just amazing. You'll see them because you'll know them as blue dragonflies out on the water. That's typically you know when there is a damsel fly population in the, in, in the venue that you're fishing. Okay? These guys, they, they act like nymphs, they can act like coronamids, but at the same time, these guys are big, high-protein meals. These things average anywhere between half inch to maybe an inch long, okay? So when we get to the patterns, you'll probably see that prevalent as far as what you got. But damselfly is a second type of what's in the water that will probably give you your best odds of being able to catch fish. Basic patterns. I have three. And what it is is attractor patterns, which is basically a reactionary type of a fly that brings the species up to you, looks at it, if it's moving in the right way, they're going to eat it. Baitfish patterns, which we talked about earlier, they represent fry patterns. And when I put insect patterns, I'm really talking about a damsel fly. Okay? So let's go to attractor patterns. Attractor patterns. Now, a lot of people when they use attractor patterns, they're thinking, oh, size 8, size 6. The largest I use is a size 10. Okay? Really small. Because if you really look at what's inside 
the water and what you're fishing, typically there's not much anything over about an inch that's actually in the water that you're trying to represent. Whether it be a leech, and that was one of the, the patterns that is real easy to cover. These are four different patterns of woolly buggers. Those are all size tens. That's part of my arsenal. I found out that these four colors, if I have all these four colors, it usually covers pretty much of what I need to do when I'm exploring around trying to find fish in the water. Black, gray, olive, and this is cinnamon. Regular chenille, nothing real fancy. I don't put a lot of flash in it or anything else, but the one biggest difference that I do do is when I do tie it on to the end of a line, it's always in a loop. Creates more action. Perch fry. I had two patterns this year that just went nuts for me. I've used one for the longest time. This is actually a punk perch. For those of you guys who are over at the flying uh, tie table that I was at, there was an original version of the punk perch that came out that allowed this fly to stay flat just like a perch fry. Because perch aren't round, they're flat. So in order to keep that, I use the original version. Instead of plucking and pulling everything out of its sides, I pull it north and south, and that's it. And when it's in the water, it keels straight up and down all the way through. So we've done this numerous, numerous times inside of the pool to see what we could do and see if it actually keeled correctly and all the rest. So that's one pattern that I use. The largest pattern I've used in that, depending on the size of what you see in the water. This year, probably perch fry were about three quarters of an inch long. I wasn't using anything real big, but I've used them up to size sixes as well. Does it work when perch fry aren't around or when bait fish aren't around? Yes, it does. You know why? Because trout are conditioned to know that that is one of their food sources through the course of the year. If they see it as a side meal someplace, they go, ooh, wow, I haven't had one of those in a long time. Boom, it's gone. They'll come and eat it. So it's not specific as to when you're using it, because it will work all the time. You may not get as many bites at the wrong time of the year, but I guarantee you'll get bites. Okay? The other fly is called a perfection perch. Okay? And it's something that it's kind of work in progress right now. I probably lost the largest fish that I've ever seen in my entire life at probably this year. Just for that one reason, it was because of that fly. Damsel flies. If you looked at Doug Umatsu's tying station today, he ties something called the purple veil fly. I've never seen anything work as well as this fly does. It's, it's amazing. I don't know whether it's the ultraviolet strands there at the end of it, just the profile and the way that it works, but I've seen this thing work everywhere. Let's talk about cadence or rhythm. And when we talk about cadence or rhythm, you know, it's how you're moving this bug, more so than anything else. There's a couple ways that we can do it. Typically what most float tubers do, when I see them on the water, they're trolling. The next one, which I think is much more effective, and I use this a lot, especially when I've been able to locate fish, is I just sit in my tube and I cast and I retreat. Type three, intermediate line, whatever the case may be, I'm moving the fly the way I want to move it. Going back to the trolling bit, I have found a way to be able to move the fly. And it, what I did is I said, well, I'm trolling and I don't feel like doing this or anything. No, I'm just going to keep it up like this and move it. I can move it soft. I can move it with a big strike. I can do anything I want with it. But that's, you're going to see me out there. And I'm just like this. I'll be da -da -da -da, trolling around. But we call it the salute. And the salute works because you can mimic a lot of different patterns without a minimal effort. As long as that line's tight, I can make it still. I can make a darting action. Cadence to match what you are imitating. I'm going to go back to those two little guys that we talked about, bait fish fry and damsel fly. Surprisingly enough, bait fish fry, you think, oh, wow, they're just always swimming around. They're doing this. They're doing that all the time. I got news for you. 50% of the time, more than 50% of the time, I've sat there and watched them in the water, and you know what they're doing? They're just sitting there, they're not doing a thing. But on the average, with a bait fish fry, or pattern that you're using with that, it's fished as slow as you can. Talk about damsels. 
Remember we talked about how erratic these guys are. It's a faster retrieve. Why? Because the species or the insect life itself is actually calling for that. The last thing when it comes to cadences is a tractor pattern. You can go all over the spectrum with that. Leeches, very slow moving. You can represent that. With the pattern that you saw with the olive woolly bugger, you can imitate a damselfly. So now it's your job to go out there, try your different cadences. If one thing's not working, go through it, and you know fish are in that area, go through that same area again, change the cadence of what you're doing. When you find that cadence, or when you get bit, try and remember what you were doing. There are so many variables with the art of stripping that it's actually harder to strip streamers than it is to still water them. And most people won't take the time to go through the, just the, the confusion, the, the mindset of, I gotta get it here, I'm gonna try it here, I'm gonna do this, but I'll tell you what, when you do, you're gonna get larger fish. Stripping flies equates to larger fish, pure and simple. Still water nymphing, it's a numbers game. You're gonna get plenty of numbers, but you never, may never get that big fish of a lifetime. Stripping streamers, you have a higher percentage of doing that. Change up your cadence or rhythm. We talked about that earlier. If you catch a fish, go over the area again. I gave you a fundamental on stripping streamers. For such an easy subject, it sure is complex. And it makes things a little bit tough sometimes to understand. But at least I give you an overview of what to look for, what to do, how to do, some of the things you may practice already.